Hey guys, Cassandra Starseed, and um, I'm excited today to read you this class that I put together, um, which I had compiled. Um, hang on one second, let me like X out of my Facebook for a minute, or it's going to ding the whole time. I should have done that before. Okay, be quiet, Facebook. Okay, um, I put together this class um, for my lodge at Abracadabra Oasis um, last weekend. And a couple people couldn't make it, so they had asked me if I would read this for YouTube, and I thought that would actually be a great idea so that other people could hear the same thing. So my class is on Orgone and how it relates to the 93 Current and the Lima. So I'm going to get started. Agape, sometimes rendered as agape, is the English transliteration of the Greek word meaning love. Specifically, agape refers to spiritual or higher love, as opposed to eros, the lower or sexual love. Love can also be creation and destruction in one fluid movement. See the Ouroboros. The word agape is important to Thelemites for numerological reasons. The Book of the Law, chapter 1, verse 39, states that the word of the law is ohima, the lima, meaning will in classic, classic Greek. The most common form of Greek gematria, the lima adds up to 93, which is therefore an extremely significant number to Thelemites. Thus we get love under will. Verse 57 of the same chapter contains the sentence, love is the law, love under will. This seems to indicate that love and will are to be balanced. As it turns out, though the word does not appear in the book, agape also enumerates to 93, so it is commonly used as the equivalent Greek term for love in the sense appearing in the verse, balancing the lima. It is indeed the devotional love of agape that flows through the 93 current. Alistair Crowley suggested that Thelemites use do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law as a greeting, and love is the law, love under will, as a farewell. Using the numerology above, it is common to abbreviate both of these to 93, especially in verbal communication and in informal written communication between Thelemites. It is common to see the greeting rendered as 93, and the farewell is 93, 93, slash 93, which is shortening for love on the left um, is the law on above. Love the denominator under will and under, uh, I'm sorry, hang on. <laughs> which is shortening for love is the law. Love the denominator under will the denominator, denumerator, sorry. <clears throat> Agape can be considered as a devotional love of, or adoration, perhaps examined by the love of a devotee for their guru, patron, or deity, etc. Within the Lima, it is often used to denote the love that permeates and impures creation, or in the heart, in the eyes of the aspirant, as they gaze upon the reflection of God in the kingdom of Malkut. So what does all this have to do with Oregon? This is from a public lecture um, by the author on May 9, 1962 at the Hewitt Auditorium, Cooper Union, New York City. The lecture was the first in a series of six lectures entitled An Introduction to Orgonomy, which were supported by the Interscience Research Institute. There is an orgonomy college in Princeton, New Jersey that continues to offer degrees in orgonomy related science. Franz Anton Mesmer called it animal magneticism. To Henry Bergeson, it was called the Elan Vital or the vital force. Um, Sigmund Freud observed its functionings in the human emotions and termed it libido and dozens if not hundreds of lesser known scientists have recorded its presence and given it a name to characterize its special properties. Among the 20th century proponents of the concept, for example, doctors Charles Littlefield and his vital magneticism and George Starr White and his cosmoelectric energy, mechanistic science in the 17th through 19th centuries embraced many of its essential qualities in the concept of ether while mystical human beings have embraced other essential qualities of it in the concept of God. Orgone energy is Wilhelm Reich's name for the substratum from which all nature is created. The best definition this author can provide for this is that orgone energy is the creative force in nature. This article will discuss briefly the history of the discovery of orgone energy by Wilhelm Reich and describe its properties. 
It will then summarize the evidence for and against the concept and finally will undertake to explain why it is that it has been met with such great resistance. Everything changes when you start to emit your own frequency rather than absorbing the frequencies around you. When you start imprinting your intent on the universe rather than receiving an imprint from the universe. Barbara Marciniak, Bringers of the Dawn. So what does the Tetragrammaton teach us about us as creator gods? The Tetragrammaton itself, um, through geomancy and Kabbalistic formulas, reveals the truth about sacred geometry, the 72 or 216 secret names of God, and the importance of the Tree of Life. Its detractus of the letters of the Tetragrammaton adds to 72 by Gematria. Um, I have to turn to Chapter 3 in my book, Hands of Isis Energy Work Unveiled, that I published last year, but I didn't bring it over, so give me one sec. So, what did I say, chapter three? Right here, okay. So this is the Tetractus. There's a diagram of it in the book. Let me see if I can get it better. Where's the camera? Okay, so it's the pyramid with the yod heh vav -Hey's in it. Okay, that's the Tetractus that we're talking about. So. There are some who believe that the Tetractus and its mysteries influenced the early Kabbalists. A Hebrew Tetractus, in a similar way, has the letters of the Tetragrammaton, the four-lettered name of God in the Hebrew scripture, inscribed on the ten positions of the Tetractus, from right to left. It has been argued that the Kabbalistic tree of life, with its ten spheres of emanation, in some way are connected to the Tetractus, but its form is not that of a triangle. The occult writer Dion Fortune says that the point is assigned to Kether, the line to Chokma, the two-dimensional plane to Bina, and subsequently the three-dimensional solid naturally falls to Chassad. The relationship between the geometrical shapes and the first four sephira is anal analogous to the geometrical correlations in the Tetractus, shown above under the Pythagorean symbol and unveils the relevance of the tree of life with the Tetractus. There are a few people who have you've probably heard of who were able to perform miracles by learning the truth behind the Tetragrammaton. Okay. So that's an excerpt from my book. Available on Lulu. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> Must be hydrated. Otherwise I will lose my voice. Okay. It is my understanding that the 72 combinations are also tied into the Goetic studies correlating Carl Jung's theory that the 72 parts of the brain were the 72 demons of the Goetia. That in magic science, we are able to externalize these and command them, leaving us using our entire brain at the end and in control of these aspects of our brain. To get even that far, we must break down the Tetragrammaton to its basic parts as it functions as the creator formula. I always explain it backwards to teach manifesting. If you look at the formula vertically, it resembles a little man. Book reference. Here we are. So you guys can kind of see little man there. Okay. So you have on the top yod, hey, making up the arms and um, top, va, and the other hey, making up the bottom. Okay. So we're going to explain this. And this is also in my book. Okay. I just got my bookmark, darn it. That's okay. Okay, so I always explain it backwards to teach manifest. If you look at the formula vertically, it resembles a little man. See my page in Hands of Isis. At the top, we have Yod. Fire, also likened to spirit. This is over his head. Spirit is in you, but it tries to communicate. 
So if you think in densities, it becomes a feeling represented by the first, um, by the first hay, like into air. The feeling, if it's not ignored, becomes a thought, which is represented by water, which is the next letter in the system. Okay, and then finally, the thought becomes manifested in reality by acting on these thoughts and producing the idea in real life represented by earth. Okay, the final hay. Yod, hay, bob, hay. It goes through the different elements. And um, to continue, I would say that um, the thought becomes manifested in reality by acting on these thoughts and producing the idea in real life represented by earth. This is how to manifest ideas and the whole secret to the secret book. The same formula can be studied in the tarot, as is the true way to learn real tarot to my knowledge. And it's why there are 72 cards and the 72 and the suits, I mean, are set up as earth for discs or pentacles, um, air for swords, fire for wands, and water for cups. So as spirit is trying to communicate with us all the time, and thus the whole goal of the Bornless Ritual is to attain knowledge and communication with the Holy Guardian Angel, people have been trying to harness this channel of information and energy for a very long time, especially if we look back to Brother Colin and Brother Brett's classes. Orgone energy, positive versus negative. Wilhelm Reich and Nikola Tesla both discovered that this ether orgone energy is everywhere. But depending on its ionized state, it can be very good or very bad for you. Positive ions from cell phones, TVs, computers, microwaves, etc. are known to cause cancer, migraines, insomnia, and other health problems. Negative ions, on the other hand, coincide with the idea of virile energy put forth in the 1800s that worked with your chakras and healed you, which is why orgone is known to cure cancer and dissolve tumors. It is also important to note that I studied Wilhelm Reich's work, which did not involve the use of crystals to purify the deadly orgone energy that built up. And thus, after the DOR was accumulated, these devices would become almost inert, but much less effective. And I also believe that that's why his patients ended up um, being cured of cancer, but dying anyways. And in the last almost 70 years, orgonomy has come a very long way since the days of Wilhelm Reich. Orgone energy was originally discovered by Wilhelm Reich in his psychiatric work, as a psychoanalyst and a student of Freud, Reich's point of departure was, quite naturally, the concept of the libido from Freud. Orgone energy was originally discovered by Wilhelm Reich in his psychiatric work. As a psychoanalyst and a student of Freud, Reich's point of departure was, quite naturally, Freud's concept of the libido. The, the libido is the energy, desire, um, the source of human striving. Reich developed the libido concept concentrating on its physical expression and simultaneous psychological content until he was able to show the relation of bodily attitude and emotion. Thus, he described the, in The Character Analysis, a book which went further than any work in history in solving the mystery of the relation of mind and body. And in this great book, Reich also described the mass pathology of the animal man. This pathology consists of a chronic rigidity of the musculature, which blocks the movement of energy underlying emotion and hence blocks the emotion, thus providing the psychic or emotional underpinning of ma mankind's universal sickness. Okay. Reich's initial work on orgone energy was done, then in-depth psychology. From this, it spread quite naturally into sociology and political science. For Reich saw quite clearly that the sickness of man was socially or culturally transmitted. His, his books, The Mass Psychology of Fascism and the Sexual Revolution, and People in Trouble, dealt with this enlargement of his in-depth psychological discoveries to the social and political scene. It was natural for a mind like Reich's to generalize and deepen his understanding of libidinal energy as he did, his medicinal work expanded beyond the field of psychiatry into more general areas of medicine and biology. The concept of the libidinal energy developed into more concrete concept or bioelectricity, which soon proved not to be electricity and was in time renamed orgone energy. Books dealing with this 
phase of Reich's discoveries are The Function of the Orgasm, which is a book I have on my shelf, um, and The Cancer Biopathy. These books constitute volumes one and two of the discovery of orgone, Reich's presentation to the world of the discovery of orgone energy. Although orgone energy was first discovered in the human body, Reich learned through painstaking observation and experiment that it existed in free form in the atmosphere. With this finding, Reich's work transcended the boundaries of biology and entered the realm of meteorology and atmospheric physics. The developments are described in the cancer biopathy, the Oranar experiment, and a series of articles which are covered under the general title of Weather Control Studies, published in scientific journals. The first and most general stage of Reich's discoveries was the cosmic function of orgone energy in the universe, and Reich here entered the realms of astronomy and astrophysics. Reich's books dealing with this stage were called Cosmic Superimposition and Ether God and the Devil. As Reich progressed from the realm of psychiatry and medicine to biology and from biology to physics, his concept of the energy, which was the force of all of his scientific work, retained its, its essential features and his understanding of energy grew and new properties were discovered. But the properties that had been discovered in the earlier narrower realms remained true in the newer broader ones. Though Reich's work runs the remarkable red thread, the connectedness that shows each discovery to be a logical progression from the previous one and each broader realm of nature studied to include the previous more restricted realm. Reich did not set out to discover cosmic truth. He was never attempting to revolutionize scientific thought. He was attempting to make, and he was not attempting to make great discoveries. Reich simply observed and experimented from day to day, setting down what he found, studying it honestly, and organizing the facts as they appeared without forcing any of them into preconceived framework. What he found was the same energy which flowed in all of the sexual embrace was present in all nature, living and non-living, and that it governed the most significant and widespread natural functions. Reich found that the same orgone energy underlay each of these classes of phenomena. Consciousness, it was sensation, emotion, perception, and thought. In life, it was animal movement, biogenesis, reproduction, evolution, and growth. And in atmospheric and cosmic processes, it was in storms, clouds, atmospheric electricity, and the creation of matter at every scale from atoms to planets, stars, and galaxies. These three realms correspond to the sequence of Reich's discoveries. From his beginning in psychiatry through biology to physics, each realm included the previous. They are in inverse order with respect to our knowledge about them. However, for Reich explored the realm of psychiatry in breadth and depth and broader realms of biology in a much more limited way, and only made a good start in his exploration of atmospheric and cosmic processes. So if you thought orgonomy was a fringe science before, it gets fringier. In the last year, um, I began having ideas about how else orgon could be used, aside from clearing chemtrails, playing with the weather, um, meditating, growing plants faster, healing yourself and others, protecting yourselves from EMFs and creating sacred spaces. Um, I was on the dark web reading about psionics and I discovered something, someone, um, that I would call the leading researcher in orgonomy right now, except that he doesn't, that I know of, use monoatomic gold, because I haven't seen that mentioned anywhere. Um, and I do use monoatomic gold in mine. His name is Tom Bearden, and he has combined everything that I ever dreamed of in terms of applying orgone for zero point energy. So I am quoting now from a book called Scholar Wars, um, 2007. It's an ebook. For the past six months, I have been undergoing the greatest paradigm shift I have ever had to go through, and it has rattled my nerves and shaken my bones. The intense adjustment of my world has come about by studying information given by Colonel Tom, Tom Bearden at his website, Shinari. The new knowledge there has necessitated a total revision of my ideas about physical reality, the world we live in, and the future of humanity. 
The paradigm shifting even actually made me dizzy on certain days as I tried to absorb and digest Bearden's vast amount of information. I am not a scientist at all, just a layman, and I have very little comprehension of the math and high physics of this new science called scholar electromagnetics. There is a great deal of information at Shinari, which needs to become common knowledge as fast as possible for the sake of the survival of life on Earth. And to that end, I have put together this small primer of Bearden's studies as a kind of beginner's guide to his website. And for the full thing, you can go and read Scholar Wars with Tom Bearden. Just search it, and it'll come up. Um, there's even actually some of his stuff on YouTube here. So um, you just put it into YouTube, and you will find some of his talks. Um, okay. You can download, you can download, okay, yeah, I told you guys that. <laughs> okay, this article has six sections. <clears throat> New waves, tapping the waves, weaponization, healing, psychoenergetics, and as it stands. New waves discovered. Longitudinal electromagnetic energy fills the vacuum of space, the time domain of space-time. Time is compressed energy. E equals time change squared. Electric power is everywhere presented in unlimited qualities, quantities, and can drive the world's machinery without need of coal, gas, oil, or any other common fuels. At any point and at any time, one can freely and inexpensively extract enormous electromagnetic energy flows directly from the active vacuum itself. Tom Bearden. I guess the first thing to try to comprehend is that a new kind of electromagnetic wave has been discovered in the empty vacuum of space, which, when engineered, can be in an inexhaustible supply of energy in great magnitude at any place in the universe. The word new is in quotes because it's because the discovery really goes back to Nikola Tesla and his discovery of what he called radiant energy. It is not new because the Russians and the KGB have been working on this technology for over 30 years and have weaponized these new longitudinal scholar waves to a great degree. These are the weapons that Nikita Khrushchev spoke of in January 1960. Quote, by 1957 to 58, the Soviets had progressed to the point of a giant scholar electromagnetic accident in the Urals, which exploded nearby atomic wastes, devastating the area. They had also progressed to the development of the new superweapons using their new energetics, weapons to which Khrushchev referred in 1960 when he informed the Soviet president of a new, fantastic weapon of destruction, a weapon so powerful that it could wipe out all life on Earth if unrestrainably employed." Unquote. After 30 years of development <clears throat> and extensive testing around the globe, these new scholar electromagnetic weapons are up and running and ready to go. Tom Bearden at his website, Shinari, discusses the history of these new scholar electromagnetic waves and his paper, Historical Background of Scholar Electromagnetic Weapons. Some Immediate Implications the implications of successful engineering of the longitudinal waves are enormous and will change the world as we know it, one way or another. Among other things, these discoveries mean that the solutions to the energy crisis and the oil problem are in hand. These oil wars are completely unnecessary. There is endless energy available freely from the domain of time. Two, unbelievably powerful weapons are not only possible, but they are already operating in several nations. The many powers of these weapons are unprecedented and quite mind-boggling. Three, mind control on a mass scale has now become possible, and the machines to do it are already in place in certain nations. It has become possible to mentally enslave whole populations with the twist of a few dials. And so the layman will need to understand that there is a new kind of electromagnetic energy that is altogether different from what he knows, like the radio, TV, cell phones, etc. The ordinary electromagnetic waves that we have known about, those are called transverse electromagnetic waves. To distinguish them from the new longitudinal electromagnetic waves, these scholar waves do not actually exist in our material world, but only exist in the vacuum of empty space or the time domain. And as we must keep in mind that this vacuum of space, as we speak, 
of exists all throughout everything. Even our bodies are mostly empty space between the atoms and molecules. And so the gateway to this seething ocean of energy that can be there at every point in the universe, the seething ocean of energy is all around us and all through us. <laughs> emptiness is full. This amazing discovery announces that the emptiness of empty space is in fact not empty, but a great ocean of energy. Colonel Bearden refers to this ocean of energy as being of the time domain, energy out of time. It seems like something from Star Trek, but at this point, which the new science of scholar electromagnetics has reached, is pretty far beyond what Star Trek had ever dreamed of. And where it is going may be beyond anything that anyone could have dreamed of. We live in a three-dimensional world, which physics calls three-space. But there is also space-time, or four-space, or the fourth dimension. And then suddenly comes this amazing new knowledge that time itself is actually compressed energy. And it is energy which is compressed by exactly the same factor by which matter is compressed and considered energy, the speed of light squared. So we have a new companion to the famous E equals MC squared. It is now paired with E equals TC squared. And as the atomic bomb released the compressed energy in matter, so we now unleash the tremendous energy that is compressed into time itself. And it gives a completely new term to the meaning time bomb. So in short, this current or energy that is pushed through orgone devices is the 93 current, literally. This is all around us and simultaneously proves that this electric, proves the electric universe theory. Tom Bearden has created devices that use orgone to push ether and electromagnetic devices with permanent neodymium magnets. They create literal free energy, which will change the world for those who can get their hands on it or make it themselves. But more than free energy, this energy, the 93 current, is exactly what seems to be implied in the Book of the Law in the New Age, in the New Aeon of Horus. I feared at first reading all of this, that the, the civilizations previous of us quite, quite possibly and probably perished due to the misuse of this energy, thus Atlantis, etc. And that we would end up the same way if this was unleashed to the general public. And it made me realize the implications in Crowley's short story, The Lost Continent, and how Atlantis had three rings. And for the outer ring, there was a sign that simply read, To enter Atlas, lie. Since I believe that America is the new Atlantis, per Manly P. Hall's work, I would say that America is set up the same way, that the Outer Ring scientists are still debating over whether tachyons actually exist, let alone how to harness them. And the inner circles have clearly had this knowledge since at least Tesla. And so we find ourselves in the inner circles, priests and priestesses in the new Aeon of Horus, and it seems to be our job at this time to be creator gods, to manifest our destinies, our lives, to lead humanity, and to destroy the old and bring in the new. There are the stubborn, who will never learn to fly, and I believe those are the slaves spoken of in Liberaz, which reads, The law of the strong, this is our law, and the joy of the world. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. Do that, and no other shall say nay. Every man and every woman is a star. There is no God but man. Man has the right to live by his own law, to live in the way that he wills to do, to work as he will, to play as he will, to rest as he will, to die when and how he will. Man has the right to eat what he will, to drink what he will, to dwell where he will, to move as he will on the face of the earth. Man has the right to think what he will, to speak what he will, to write what he will, to draw, paint, carve, etch, mold, and build as he will, to dress as he will. Man has the right to love as he will, to take your fill of will and love as ye will, when, where, and with whom ye will. Man has the right to kill those who would thwart these rights. The slaves shall serve. Love is the law, 
Love Under Well. I would like to wrap this all up with a part from the most important book I've ever read in my whole life called The Secret Rituals of the Man in Black. I just gotta let my cat in. She's clawing at the door like crazy. Come on, cat. Alright, I'm terribly sorry about that. Okay. Quote, The strangest thing is figuring out why UFO knots abduct people and what stops them from doing so. Since magical ritual contacts them and banishes them, we know that they are magical beings or that magic is a technology or both. But when I started working with Reikian technologies that the Knights of Malta would give their fortunes to have, I noticed something most strange. UFOs can be disintegrated by Reikian energies. Quote, well, that's strange, but hardly new. Reich himself said he was doing that in the 50s. Quote, right, but consider what Reich worked with. He called it orgone energy, which was a direct outgrowth of his work with Freudian psychotherapy. Up through a certain point, he was just an orthodox Freudian until he discovered that the very energies that Freud addressed in psychological terms were explainable as a universal energy or current, a kind of orgasmic flux of the universe, inherent, which could be channeled, quantified, and apparently used to shoot down flying saucers. Orgone energy, it seems to me, is identical to the love-will current of Aleister Crowley's Book of the Law. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that the energy behind human libido destroys ultra-terrestrial craft? Quote, They drink our fear like hungry ghosts. To drink instead our love is death unto them and their kin. Quote, Who are you quoting? Quote, That would be telling. The truth lies in another direction, one that few writers, even writers of science fiction, have guessed at. <clears throat> Although the late Frank Herbert came very close in his Dune novels, and the early UFO not trans channeler Mark Probert came even closer, we have not been taken over, and we are not property. Not because aliens do not want our planet, nor because others have protected us, but because the dark forces from deep space are quite simply, and for some mysterious reason, very afraid of us Earthlings. They are, in fact, frightened to death of us. This shows up in some of the literature. The jealousy of the gods of Genesis, that having gained wisdom from the tree of knowledge, we might eat of the tree of knowledge and thus become gods ourselves. The story of Titan Prometheus bringing fire from heaven to humanity, for which the gods punished him in unimaginable ways. And the Norse and Teutonic myths of the very mortal gods preparing for cosmic combat against the frost giants and their allies. All of these stories in ultra-terrestrial terms tell us of beings and forces of human or close to human that have defied the conquerors of a thousand worlds and put them repeatedly to flight. Mark Probert's communications were not with aliens in the true sense, but rather with an assembly of 16 guardians who have protected the earth from ill influences for thousands of years. All of these beings, and please understand this, please, started out as human as you or I. They are the ascended or hidden masters of the great brotherhood of the Adepti, people who have become super beings. They have turned their attentions to guiding our evolution to becoming what they themselves are. They do not lead us, they do not govern us, nor own us. In a very real sense, they are us. Some of these shining individuals walk amongst us unseen, just as do agents of darker forces from far worlds. And there are, I can tell you, with absolute and unshakable certainty, representatives of both this brotherhood here in this great hall tonight, and of their opposition. They took little interest in my work as long as I was a common UFO field investigator, collecting samples of grass and interviewing Charlie Hickston or John Reeves or other contactees and abductees. All that I have learned in ufology where I started looking out for advanced beings from other planets, like everyone else, has taught me that humans are, in potential, the most advanced developed beings in the entire galaxy. The positive aliens are not here to help, 
but like the Magi in the Nativity story, to witness the birth of a new being. The greys, insectoids, and other vampiric nightmares from dying stars are here to suck out a little of the life energy that they themselves have so little of, and to delay the inevitable evolution of humanity triumphant. Mark Probert's 16 Guardians were merely the first. We, as they tell us, and as the intercepted cipher messages have told me, and with all eyes to see, we will someday be the coming guardians ourselves.